Welcome to the Charlevoix Stories Project, a continuation of the Charlevoix Oral Traditions Project. Today is March 9th, 2016, and we are at the Charlevoix Public Library in Charlevoix, Michigan. I am Mary Snyder, and our videographer is Rick Pierpont of Pierpont Productions in Harbor Springs, Michigan. We are pleased to be speaking today with Bernie Ward III, one of the partners with his brother Donald in a long established Charlevoix business, Ward Brothers Charter Boats Incorporated, located right on beautiful Round Lake at the <laughs> east end of Antrim Street in downtown Charlevoix. Yes. Yes. Can you please tell us, first of all, before we go back and talk about the history of your business and your family, mm -hmm. what your current business is? Well, we, of course, started out fishing. But we're still fishing, only we're fishing for different things now, you know. And uh, the charter boats have, uh, you know, have been a, I guess, a labor of love for us. And uh, you know, we started out very, very small, but right now we have three thirty-one Bertrams that we use for fishing, and uh, the salmon fishing has kind of went, you know, t -t 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 downhill the last year or so. But we're still in the lake trout thing, and steelhead. And uh, our season is usually May, with the way the weather is this year, it'll be early May, because March has been so warm, and it's usually through September. Hmm. And you have pontoons also? In the rental end of it, we have three pontoons, and uh, one's 50 horse, then we have two that are uh, they're 24 feet long, two that are 115, and they can, you know, tow a, a tube, and they're quite popular. You know, three or four families, or depending on the size, can be two families. But Lake Charlevoix is perfect for them. So, yeah. You're also a full service marina. Well, we are mostly service on, let's say, Merc Cruiser, Volvo Penta, and outboard. Um, the names have changed. It used to be, you know, Evan Rue Johnson, OMC. Mm -hmm. Now it's Bombardier. Uh, and E-Tech is the big, the big thing now. Direct injection and hi. You have to have a computer to work on the thing. The adjusting the carburetors <laughs> and the points are. Well, we still get some of those, but it's a, uh, you know, they're eventually wear out. Mm -hmm. so. so how did you ever get started in the business? Well, my grandfather uh, got into selling bait and doing sealhead charters. And then he, you know, he was kind of, uh, you wouldn't think that somebody would start in the depression with a new business. Mm -hmm. But he did it and... It's just grown from there. So he and his brother, I think, yeah. were the originals. Yeah. Um, Archie. How did they? How did they get the land? And what was the land like at that time? Uh, the land thing was more location, and uh, he built a small little shack there to sell bait out of, and and it was quite, uh, you know, humble beginnings. As far as, well, you see the little little shack, and I think he just asked the guy, LeBlanc at the time, to just, hey, can I put up the thing here, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And I think he went for probably a good 10 years right there. And mm -hmm. I think he sold uh, uh, Equitable or Metropolitan Insurance in the wintertime. So, okay. And then what? And then eventually, my when Archie, uh, I think I told you yesterday that he he was got diabetes before there was much medicine for it, and I remember going to the hospital. I think I was like four or five years old. And, now Archie was his business partner. Your grandfather's yeah, business partner. Yeah, and I think they were. Uh, I think he was a half brother, because oh. my grandpa was adopted, okay. so they were. Uh, but he, 
uh, see, I think he was quite young, like 38 mm -hmm. years old. And, uh, you know, he, and I, I think I, when I went up to visit him, it was like two weeks before he passed away. Mm -hmm. But with that, they, my grandpa used to own the whole, the apartment behind, and where Hoffman is now, the lawyer, oh, used to own the whole thing. And then he sold off the that to get to pay off his widow, Archie's widow. For he owned it all the way from Belvedere, from Belvedere Avenue down to down to where our shop is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now we've bought back the apartment that's right behind our. I wish we could have bought it back for the same <laughs> <my> grandpa <laughs> <laughs> sold it for, but. <laughs> hey. Man. Twelve dollars? <laughs> yeah. Actually five thousand. But boy. You talked yesterday about the fact that at one time your um, land that you owned around Lake was separated. You owned something further down? Yeah, we had uh, grandpa had uh, like I mentioned before yesterday, you remember the old laundry and there was a boathouse in the right about where the harbor master's office is now. All right. Okay, he had 30 feet and 15 feet of the boathouse. So we had 45 feet altogether. Well, the city wanted to expand the marina to the north. And, uh, and he, we ended up trading 45 feet for 30 feet right next to where we have our dock now. Our, and the extension, where we parked the charter boats and rental boats. And mm -hmm. It was... Uh, I kind of thought he should have traded 45 for 45, but <laughs> it's before I was being asked about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So your grandfather um, did the bait and he did some net fishing? Like I said, we, we were a fishing family type of thing. Mm -hmm. And we catch, uh, we were gill netting for perch mostly. And uh, he had a tug that was, uh, well, there's kind of a, a funny story about the tug thing. I must have been five or six years old, and you're, you're interested in what's going on. So I went out with this tug, and it was a wood tug. And I, and I noticed that the, it was a little bit of a swell out in Lake Michigan, and the, the motor would move with the, when you're going over waves. And along the side, you could see that the water was coming in. And uh, uh, my dad said, well, don't worry about it. You know, they had pumps and everything. And so I mentioned that to my mother when we got off the lake. And when uh, she asked my dad, is, is that what's going on? Is it this boat, you know, the motor moves and you can see the water coming in? He says, yes. And uh, that was the last time I went out on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a setup on the uh, engine where they could valve off pulling water, cooling water from the, from the lake and use the engine to pump, to pump her out, to keep her, you know. It sounds like that might have been smart. <laughs> yes, they had a, it was a backup, you know. Could you explain um, how gill nets were set and how you were gill net fi uh, fishermen before? Yeah. If I remember right, we had a, it was from knot to knot, it was like two and three eighths, if, I'm, if uh, memory serves me. Mm -hmm. it might have been smaller, but in that area. And the gill net is set up like a, like four foot, four and a half feet, you know, had leads on the bottom, corks on the top, so it stands up. When the fish swim into it, they get hung up on the, they can't back out, they get hung up on the, on the nets. Mm -hmm. We used to, grandpa and great grandpa, used to tie up new nets in the basement of, uh, we, the old building didn't have any heat in the winter. They used to make up their new nets on uh, State Street, 601 State Street. Used to do it, do it in the basement. What's in the there winter. now? Uh, they sold and another, the same house was there, mm -hmm. but it was a full basement they used to string, have it from one end to the other and do the, do the corks and the leads. And we used to even pay kids, uh, uh, I think it was a dime a piece for the, they were aluminum corks. And you'd see them float up 
yep. on the on the shore, and they pick them up, and you get a and reuse it, recycling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how many are they measured in yards or feet? Yeah, you know, I don't have a, a recollection of, you know, they used to talk about boxes of nets and mm -hmm. how how long they were. Yep. Uh, it's been a while. I, I don't know exactly what the distance was, but uh, I do remember that they, uh, uh, the net company, they would send them so many meters and, and they used to have it down to, they put so many corks on, you know, a certain length, but that detailed information I don't have uh, right out of that. Did you ever see your family pull those nets in? Oh yeah, yeah, that was, that was part of the thing when I would go out with them, mm -hmm. they had a lifter. And the lifter had a, uh, you know, was round, and it had a little Wisconsin motor that made this whole thing run. And the lifter came up and had teeth on it that would, you pull the, the meters together, and it helped you pull the net in. And then they had boxes that were set up to, to get the, not only the fish, but the whole thing in these boxes. And, you know, they, we still have, we still have the, if the, uh, buoys would come off. We still have the grappling that they uh, that they would use to to go fish for the nets if the if the buoy came undone mm -hmm. or got you know got rough or something and it wasn't there. We still have it. It's uh, as a matter of fact the harbor master borrows it every once in a while. Somebody drops something in. <laughs> so did they pick the fish off the nets as as they were pulled in? No, they go all into a box, and then you get an empty box, and then you run, run the nets over and pick the fish out. They they made a uh, it was almost like a a little uh, uh, like you had a screw eye thing mm -hmm. that you would you know screw into a piece of wood, and the wood was about like that, and then you could you know take off the where the fish was caught, and then you know put them into a bucket and. We used to supply uh, uh, about three restaurants in town with filleted perch. Do you yeah. remember the restaurants? Yeah, Parkside was one of them. Mm -hmm. When the Sugar Bowl used to be in the middle of town, yeah. that was another. Turkey I think was? the woodshed that is now Giuseppe's out, yeah. mm -hmm. that was another. And uh, uh, Riccardi's, the the between Charlevoix and uh, Torch River there. It's, it's been vacant now for a few years. It's right on the Torch Lake shore there. Mm -hmm. They used to take, yeah. Where were your fishing grounds? Grandpa was quite, uh, uh, what would you call it? Uh, Secretive. Tight, cheap, whatever you want to call it. He wouldn't go very far. Okay. Yeah, Norwood. Probably would be the farthest down, uh -huh. you know, south, and north probably Big Rock, and that was our area. Did you have to mark your nets some way? So that yeah, the buoys had a, you know a staff and then a little flag. And, uh -huh. you know, and back then we didn't have any numbers, but now of course you have to. The Native Americans have to have a numbered and you know, all that stuff, but mm -hmm. we didn't have that back then. Yeah. So you were probably fishing when the eels came in? Um, yeah, when the eel thing started going on and then the eel wives started to be pretty high numbers, then the perch fishing started dying off, probably early 60s. Yeah, early 60s. And then we eventually you know, went from the, the wood tug to a steel tug to selling the tug. Couldn't, couldn't pay for gas. Was that when you changed over to uh, doing more sport fishing? Yeah, more sport fishing, more rental boat type of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had, see for a while there when you had had a very predictable run that came into Round Lake, he had probably 45, 50, uh, you know, little rowboats, 14 foot, galvanized, you know, made made for protected water, you know, flat bottom, mm -hmm. you know, but fairly stable. 
he used to go down to, uh, I think I mentioned here, Goshen, Indiana. Freeland Boats was the name of the, of the uh, company. And he had a trailer that we still have, matter of fact. Uh, and we used to put like, like three or four boats on a pickup truck. And then this trailer was set up with, you know, cogs and you'd pile these maybe four. I think he even told me that one time they put six on this trailer and then bring them home. And I, if memory serves me, I think he, he used to pay like $72 for a 14 foot boat. Know how far back that. <laughs> and his his whole business thing was that if you could not pay for this boat in one season or pay for whatever you wanted to do, if it wasn't a one season thing because we were seasonal, you didn't do it. And so he had it down where uh, I think he used to rent these boats for. They could paddle out or bring their own engine and uh, five bucks for the day. Oh my goodness. Five bucks. And the stamp you used to stamp the postcards with was, I think, three cents. Mm -hmm. Woo! Different time. Definitely. And then most of his customers, I think, for like Southern Michigan, Ohio, and when the perch were in and he sent those cards out the next weekend, Whew, we had all kind of people showed up to, you know, for they could fill their, the great part was fishing was so good that he would, you know, I think they could catch 50 back then. So they would fill a bucket up in probably half a day. They'd come in and people were saying, well, where'd you get those fish? And then they'd, then they'd hey, let's go out there. And he'd, he'd get two days, he'd get another five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but what year was that? It had to be, uh, see, I think I was in grade school, middle school. So it had to be in the, like, 50s, mm -hmm. 50s and maybe early 60s. And then, of course, it, it went away. So we had to shift gears, mm -hmm. do something different. Yeah. Yeah. What was Round Lake, the basin, like back in those years when he started that business and he was doing um, more the commercial fishing rather than the sport? Well, there was, of course, a lot of uh, boathouses and, uh, and a lot of wood boats, of course, and uh, less houses, more marinas, and, uh, well, you can kind of see here where... Uh, uh, you know, all wood boats, mm -hmm. and the the bulkhead, of course, has changed now, where they've straightened it out, and uh, and right next to us was another was another marina. What marina was that? Well, um, you heard the name Schleiman. Yes. And I don't, I don't exactly. Let me get my glasses on. I if he had a, what was his. Uh, Chalavoy Marine Supply was his okay. name of his company. Didn't he also own over on Lake Charlevoix where Northwest Marine is in there? Um, he might have. See, now we, we own, you see this bulkhead here? Mm -hmm. When the condos were put up here, when those built, these two buildings were tore down, now we own this, the, the bulkhead. And it kind of paired with the, uh, with the thirty feet here, mm -hmm. and uh, so we've kind of expanded our little place. Even though we're, you know, it's only two forty foot lots there. We we own this. I think this is ninety three feet. The bulkhead, mm -hmm. and with the thirty feet here, we get a little more to deal with. You told an interesting story about how someone backed a boat in there, and the and um, yeah, yeah. Can you tell that story? Yes, we uh, Yorktown was uh, uh, what about two seasons they came in. Well, they were you know it's a, there was two hundred and forty seven foot a boat, and the docks at the marina were not made for her, 
And our dock was pretty well taxed too, because it's a big, huge thing. But they had a, uh, uh, you know, a sub captain that was, you know, the regular captain was off, and this guy was the backup captain. Well, backing into our slip, he got a little bit close to our bulkhead, so he goosed it a little bit and dredged, you know, as a huge prop in this thing, mm -hmm. dredged out uh, a kind of a hole, probably almost as big as the as the room here, as far as you know, this side of it. A big. That's big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then one of our kids was uh, were swimming when a hot day, in this when he dug this out, a prop from one of the old fishing boats came up. It was two blades were sticking out, so he mm -hmm. picked it out, and it was on a steel shaft, and it must over vibration or something had broke off, and it had been there for who knows how long. But now my secretary is I think gonna make some kind of a lamp out of it or something. <laughs> so, did you ever go down into Round Lake and look for things, fool around, swim? Oh, we've, uh, it's amazing. We had, we dredged, well, the last time we had low water, which would be in the 80s, we dredged because we needed, you know, mm -hmm. water there. And there's everything imaginable you can think of radios, old tires, uh, spoons, um, Coke bottles, uh, just just uh, everything you can think of is in the bottom of the lake. Plus wood and you know everything, uh -huh. but amazing. You know fish baits, but <laughs> everything you can think of is in the bottom of that lake. What keeps that lake so pristine clean? Well, we we have a unique situation with uh, with the different pressures you have. Mm -hmm. between Lake Charlevoix and Lake Michigan, the, the, the uh, river, it, it moves both ways. So we get kind of a flushing action. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, changed where the, the sewage plant works. Do you remember the sewage plant down on Round Lake? Yes, my father worked there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it ended up that was only a settling type system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, it didn't have any real treatment much for the effluent that went into Round Lake. But now, of course, it's, it has, you know, it's much different. But it, it, during rainstorm, uh, you knew it was dumping in because you'd see the different colors. Yeah. What a difference now. It's uh, where, where the discharges in Lake Michigan, you, you, my dad used to show me when it came in and when it went back in the lake, it was clear. Yeah. We're doing a good job now. <laughs> and we're glad. <laughs> yes, very much so. So the change in, the, in where the sewage plant was is, is a big difference in Round Lake. But what other changes have you seen come in with the park and uh, over the, the last 30, 40, 50 years with the park and the things that come into the park? Well, the, you know, the, by taking, you know, recently by redoing the, the whole setup there where the entertainment thing is, has been changed and opened up, um, the design of the park now, the, the designer was a pretty smart guy and he made it so, see the, before the, everybody was parked, you know, east and west. So you had Sterner bow of the boat was was right at the bulkhead. Mm -hmm. Now with it with the floating docks out and the walkways, you have an alleyway, so you look out on the water, and uh, it kind of brings the water to you. And it's visually much nicer, mm -hmm. much much better setup. Uh, we didn't think initially that with it sticking out in the water that you know, navigation wise, you, it was going to be a problem, but it, it really, I mean, it, it impacted the lake some, it took away some of the places where you could fish, but, um, the advantages of, uh, of, you know, the floating docks and individual docking. And I think that from a management thing really works out pretty well. Now, did you extend your dock at that time, or had your dock already been out as far as it was? 
we had done one extension, one 60 foot extension before they started the changeover. We went out another 60 feet, so we're at 120 from the from our original. And the uh, uh, we hadn't changed the actual location of the dock. It stayed the same place, but it, we went from just like the like the bridge. We went from you know, a wood dock to steel. And, uh, you know, wood planking, but. Uh, Did your grandpa put the first dock in there? Actually, it was the city. Oh. And, and we didn't actually own the dock for quite a few years, but the, the uh, uh, city didn't charge. Like in the 30s and 40s and, and then the early part of the 50s, they didn't charge for the dock. It was just like a where you you pull in the dock and you know that was kind of your dock for the season, but that didn't work too well. Was you went out cruising, then then somebody pulls in there and who's gonna you know didn't have a harbor master either, so who is gonna decide whose dock this is? So in our case, we didn't own the dock, but we could use the be the southern part of it. Mm -hmm. If we would maintain it, if we'd put cleats on it, or if we had a rotten plank, we'd put we we could use it, and then the city used the other side. But it's your dock now. Yeah, when we <coughs> traded for with the forty five thirty thing, when we traded, then then we got the dock, and then we we switched it from being a dock. wood dock, like is in this picture. The wood part now is we got it's steel, steel and 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 if you look real close, before we had storage, you see right here, mm -hmm. that's the bow of my dad's charter boat at Bellinger's, mm -hmm. just barely see it. Mm -hmm. It was outside and we used to cover it with a canvas. That's what where she sat, but you can see where the you see the piling on the bottom here. We. When the piling started to get rotten, in the when the ice was on Round Lake, we put a steel pipe in there, and propped the dock up on that, so it would it would still it could still use what was in the water, and it's kind of got an upslope to it, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, but you know we had wood, we used hardwood cleats and yeah, it, uh, it served its purpose, but now we've of course it's uh, it's on steel. And uh, we even had to, uh, two winters ago, you remember how cold it was in mm -hmm. February? It's the first year we had ice damage on our dock. It had froze all the way across Round Lake, and it pushed, and it buckled uh, at the bulkhead, buckled the steel, and we had to have that repaired two springs ago. So. Now, does Round Lake, um in the wintertime, does it do the same thing that it did 40, 50 years ago, or do you see uh, two years ago as being very unusual? Yeah, we had a we had two winters that were exceptional for cold. But didn't they used to uh, put shanties on Round Lake years ago? Um, I think that one time it, 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 it all depends on the yeah. on the on the weather. If it gets it needs to get really really cold for uh -huh. a long time. And normally, the if you had a shanty on there, you were out of the channel, where it works back and forth. Okay. Uh, I've seen people fish on it, some, but no shanties in the recent history. Maybe back in the 30s and 40s, maybe. But uh, yeah, there's. Of course, you have to be really brave to be a ice fisherman. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I know you talked with your mom yesterday. Did your mom tell you any fun type of things? Um, she has, uh, uh, you know, she's going through dementia and stuff, so it's a little bit harder. But yeah, there's. She of course lived with the same thing that when I was a kid. Uh, we, you know, we have all kinds of experiences going here and going there. And and uh, my grandpa one time, uh, I remember quite vividly, we had. Uh, there was this guy that pulls into our uh, uh, marina, and I must have been like 15, 16 years old, 
this boat had been uh, uh, about a 50 footer. And you did not wave any money in front of my grandpa. And he, 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 what did you want for it? <laughs> so, so he wanted this boat uh, delivered over to Marinette Menominee, Wisconsin, you know, in the border there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was going to, uh, uh, it had been through a fire. And where it, it came from, they had, it had burned down about three planks down and the house was all gone. So this boat was a 50 foot, like a runabout. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had a console made, had, I think if I remember right, four, uh, 440 Chryslers in it. So he wanted this boat delivered across. So we picked a nice day and, uh, and we, this boat had, it didn't have a horn. I don't think it even had lights on it, but it, it was open boat and we, we took it across. And then I think we had the pastor of our church drive a car around, you know, US 2, mm -hmm. drive a car around and, <laughs> and got it over there and then drove back. We, I think we left about six o'clock in the morning and got back about midnight. Uh, so, yeah, it's a great thing for somebody, young kid, to get out in the water and, you know, oh yeah. Have you met some really interesting people through your business? Um, yes, charter-wise, we've had, I've had uh, Bill Freehand from the Tigers, you know, when they won mm -hmm. World Series, had him out fishing once. Um, had uh, Jeff Rulin used to play for when the Washington, I think they were the Bullets back then. I think they're the Capitals now or something. But he went fishing with me once, a big tall guy. You know, I'm 6'5", I'm, I'm and he's 6'10". He could barely get in our, you know, had to duck to get in the office. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Now, I know you've brought a lot of pictures with you. Should we just go through some of your pictures? And, um... Sure. My dad's 1968 Corvette, my skiff, that's uh, 1960, 31. And then the first my friend uh, is a 27 Connie, and that was the first boat we had that was twin engine. You said the name of the boat was my friend. Can you tell us how yeah. your boats are named? Well, this, of course, my mother. Mm -hmm. And this was after my brother and I, and the, this was my friend too. Uh, you know, we kept going with my friend, that's my dad, my dad's thing. Yeah. Yep, and this is the boat that I took down to Nashville when they redid it. Quite, uh, quite a trip. Okay, and that's... Was that your first boat then? Your own first boat? Well, um... I was dating my wife, who of course works here at the library now, and she found the boat in, uh, you know, in the paper down there. And, uh, down where? In Chicago. Mm -hmm. It was at Belmont Harbor. And uh, uh, I think it was in the Tribune, Chicago Tribune, is where she, and it sounded to her to be good. And I was in college at Central and uh, of course, we had this boat mm -hmm. already, and similar size-wise, same engines, 283 Chevys, and um, went down to look at it, and uh, and of course the guy says, uh, "Well, let's go for a ride, see if you, you know." And it was at a mooring. We had to go by dinghy out there, and uh, went for a ride. Seemed to run fine. I think this probably had to be in the early 70s when I went to look at her. Uh, and, uh, and he wanted uh, 5,500 bucks for it. Well, I'm a college kid, you know. And I, That's a lot and, of money. And, and then, I, then I thought, well, you know, I was sweating bullets. I thought, oh my, 5,500 bucks. And then, then, of course, he wanted a deposit. <laughs> now, what college kid has got a deposit in his wallet. So my future father-in-law gave him a couple hundred bucks and we got the boat. <laughs> and in the fall, I think it was like in October, October, when we looked at it, mid-October, mid I think they had 
they closed this harbor at the end of the month. Police protection went off and all that stuff. So we had to pick it up uh, before that happened and then drove it back up on, by water. And I went and got uh, the cradle from where it was winter storage and drove that up. I think it was my dad and I think it was Leonard Doobie he used to work was this for the city. He was the, mm -hmm. the garage manager. He came up with it. And they did it, I think, on two different weekends where they would take it. I think it went to Holland and they left the boat. And then from Holland, they went to, I think, Frankfurt and then Frankfurt home. Mm -hmm. That's how we got it. Yep. Why don't you show the bigger picture of it? Is that boat still on the water? You yes, that? yes. That's the one we went to Nashville with. This is a bigger picture. And if you look real close, there's my wife, Sandy. Hmm. You should yeah. have your father-in-law in there. Yeah, he. Uh, we have some other pictures of him, but yeah, he kind of helped things out. That's for sure. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I just show the pictures of the boats you currently have. Right. Yeah, these are the current boats. Uh, that's my thirty-one with a bridge, and you see the dock there is, uh, you know. It's all steel now, and she's uh, the biggest thing about these birch rooms is the the back deck is big, great for fishing. You got a nice open cockpit, fairly low to the water too, dip fish easy, and uh, and they have uh, worked out very well. Now, yeah. do you fish salmon with that boat? Uh, yeah, even though the salmon fishing has been you know mm -hmm. you know fading off, we'll be mostly lake trout and uh, and steelhead. You know, you mentioned that that uh, the salmon is dropping off. If you go back to 2008 and you look at um, the recession that we had in 2008, how was it that you were able to withstand that downtrend and uh, keep your business uh, viable? Well, I think we're kind of in a unique situation here in Charlevoix. Um, the people that come here are coming. And uh, uh, we have a diverse you know, population that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just not, see a lot of ports are set up where it's just fishing. You know, they come just to fish or be on the beach. Here there's, uh, you know, we're in the middle, you know, Charlevoix, Petoskey, Harbor Springs area. We have a have a traditional summer, you know, draw of people, and they they continue. And and yeah, you'll see it drop off a little bit. But we were very lucky to have uh, not only the fishing part of it, but uh, you know the rental part of it and the and the recreational part of it. And the gas dock. And yeah, we, we are now with, we have storage, mm -hmm. we have a gas dock, we have repairs, and we have a ship store, we sell stuff, and uh, you know, related to, to the yachting thing. So just the diversification of what you do is yeah, yeah. very helpful. In well, in, 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 there was a time where the fishing part of it was, let's say, maybe 75, 80% of our business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's continued to shrink somewhat, and then the rest of the story is with the rest of the things of, of repairs and storage and, and uh, you know, that, and the rental part, is, especially the pontoon thing has been quite stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The people are, uh, you know, when your time shrinks and your amount of time you can be on vacation shrinks, you're looking for that, that deal, you know, and the pontoon thing, affords that, mm -hmm. you know, where you can get more people out and, and have a good time on, on a little bit smaller budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have um, the Russell Lynn and the Fran. Yeah, this is the, this is the boat that isn't, uh, doesn't have bridge. And it's, you know, named after my niece and nephew, Russell Lynn and Natalie Lynn. Mm -hmm. And we got this boat. Um, 
uh, used to park on the north side of Round Lake. I was probably in uh, probably in high school, so I'm out with one of our 14 foot Lone Star boats. This boat, they were all just taking a ride. I think I was going to uh, to check on one of our rentals, so it, I'm, it gets a little choppy. So here I am with this 14 footer getting boom, boom, boom. This deep V hull 31 was got a lesson in hull design <laughs> very early with this following her in. Got behind her and let her break the sea for me. <laughs> yeah. And this is the My Friend 3 now. Mm -hmm. The third boat. Same setup without a bridge and, you know, big cockpit. And uh, this boat came from uh, Wallstrom's also. And had uh, been in storage for eight or nine years and hadn't been out. And we rehabbed her and uh, got her in the winter time and started going, had the decks were all, yeah, these, for glass boats, these Bertrams had wood decks, vinyl covered. Hmm. So we've changed over the Russell Inn and Sandy over to glass decks, but she's still got the wood. Uh, the wood's a maintenance thing, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So if yeah. you think about the future of your business and, um, having it stay in the family with the kids. Yeah. Are you training the children, um, the next generations? I'm, I'm not sure, uh, even though I'm, you know, 66 and a relatively good health. Um, I'm not sure if any of my kids want it, but uh, we'll see. Uh, yeah, it's something I'd like to keep uh, in the family. Um, we have... Uh, you know, it's an opportunity, but my one daughter, my middle daughter, Kelly, tells me, uh, uh, you, you work too much. I'm not sure they want to, you know, make that kind of commitment during, you know, it's like April through, you know, November, if you want to work seven days a week. These kids want to play a little bit more. So, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if it, I'm hoping that something like that happens because, you know, it's kind of a, it kind of, it's almost like, uh, uh, like when Sandy and I go on vacation, and we do once in a while, and we go to Florida. Uh, she wants to go to the beach. Well, when it's warm out, I don't go to the beach. It's work. So it's really, really hard for me to, <laughs> to, to vacation with any, you know, like try to relax when it's warm out. You just don't, you're not used to it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else that you would like to add? Well, uh, it's been it's been fun in our business to see where we've come from, mm -hmm. and you know, hopefully, we're headed to you know to get a little bit bigger and to get a little bit better at what we're doing. I I I hope that my brother's son is kind of things he wants to continue on and if one of my four children want to do it or maybe they want to be a management team I don't know but I'm hoping that that we can it'll stay in the family well you certainly have been an important business to Charlevoix and have yeah, yeah, um, it's... certainly enhanced the yeah. whole uh, atmosphere of the area sure so we yeah. hope so too yeah thank you so much you bet Thank <laughs> you.